Ionization energy is going to be the topic in this lesson, and this is our second periodic trend. We already covered atomic radius. In the next lesson, we'll cover electron affinity and electronegativity, but in this one, we're covering ionization energy, the energy it takes to remove an electron. And we'll talk about the general trend on the periodic table. We'll talk about the exceptions to that general trend, and then we'll talk about successive ionization energies when atoms lose more than one electron. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do DAT, MCAT, and OAT prep as well. You'll find those courses at chadsprep.com. Now, this is part of my new general chemistry playlist. Uh, I'll be covering a whole year of general chemistry over the school year, several lessons a week. So if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so let's get into this a little bit. And so once again, ionization energy is the energy it takes to remove an electron, but there's a, a little more technically to that definition. And it turns out it is the energy it takes to remove an electron from a gaseous atom to form a gaseous ion. And we can represent this with a chemical reaction. So if we do this for lithium, let's say the first one that's gonna be on our list here, or on our graph here. So you'd start with lithium, a gaseous lithium atom, and we're gonna remove an electron. And when you remove an electron, it's a product and you're going to form a gaseous lithium ion in the process. And I, I specifically said that the electron is going to be a product because uh, what we're going to find out in the next lesson when we talk about electron affinity, that's going to be the energy it takes to, uh, or the energy change associated with gaining an electron. And in that case, an electron will be a reactant. So that's why I want to focus and make sure you realize that the electron is on the product side. When we're talking about ionization energy and we're going to form a cation here in this case. And, uh, electrons are negative. Uh, they're part of an atom because they're attracted to that nucleus, which has all the protons and it's positively charged. And so if you want to remove that electron away from that nucleus and away from that atom, it is going to cost energy. So uh, ionization energies are endothermic. And in this case, for lithium specifically, we can see here that this is going to cost 520 kilojoules per mole. Cool. Now, uh, on your study guide there, there's an entire uh, list that kind of shows the general trend here. And uh, the general trend is just the exact opposite of atomic radius, uh, atomic radius, and for good reason. So we said atomic radius increases towards francium. And by the time you get to big old fat francium here, his valence electron is so far away from his nucleus that it, the attraction's not great. And that's the easiest one to pluck off. And, and it's not just that he's so big, but it's also that he has a very low effective nuclear charge, just plus one for those alkali metals on, on a rough approximation. So having a low effective nuclear charge and being so large uh, shows there's not a great attraction for those valence electrons for the nucleus, comparatively speaking. And so they're the easiest ones to remove. And so uh, whereas francium is the largest in terms of atomic radius, it is the smallest in terms of ionization energy. And it's the exact opposite direction. So in this case, uh, ionization energy is going to increase going left to right across uh, as uh, effective nuclear charge increases, and it's also going to increase going up a group as size decreases. So it's exactly the opposite of atomic radius for the general trend. And so uh, we'll find out there are some exceptions here, and you definitely have to know those exceptions. So in this lovely graph, kind of demonstrates those exceptions nicely in red here. So we see that in general, as you move across the period two elements from lithium all the way over to neon, that in general, we're going to have an increasing ionization energy here. So, but there are two key places where that is not going to be true. And so we can see here in red that for beryllium, so it's actually higher than for boron, where normally, again, going left to right across the period, we should see an increase. And we see that from lithium to beryllium, we see that from boron to carbon to nitrogen, we see that from oxygen to fluorine to neon, but we don't see it from beryllium to boron, and we don't see it from nitrogen to oxygen. There's a brief reversal of the trend. So you can kind of think of this as in the case of beryllium, is here we have a filled S subshell. His electron configuration ends with S2, and we can see that is true for beryllium and magnesium and calcium and stuff like that. They have a filled S subshell, and it turns out that's something stable about that. And so losing an electron when you're in a stable place costs a little more energy, and that's why he ends up being a little higher than boron. Now nitrogen, on the other hand, turns out has a half-filled P subshell. And if you recall, when you've got an exactly half-filled subshell, there was something special about that for some of the transition metals like chromium and molybdenum. Uh, and the key was that 
according to Hund's rule, each orbital, in this case, each p orbital is going to have uh, an unpaired electron, and their spins align, and their spins aligning is going to lower that energy. Well, in this case, we've got three electrons with their spins aligned. If we remove one, we'd only have two, and it wouldn't be as low in energy not having three spins that are aligned and only having two. Uh, and so it turns out it's going to cost a little more energy to remove an electron, both from beryllium as well as from nitrogen, so much so that it's higher than the one immediately to the right. So in this case, beryllium's higher than boron, and in this case, nitrogen's higher than oxygen in terms of ionization energy. And that continues on down the periodic table a couple of rows. So just like beryllium is higher than boron, so is magnesium than aluminum and calcium than gallium, it turns out as well. And not only is nitrogen higher than oxygen, phosphorus is higher than sulfur, and arsenic is higher than selenium. So, and those are some exceptions you definitely need to know. Now, some of you might be on the hook for some more exceptions, some of you might not, but it turns out for a filled D subshell, the same thing is true. So zinc, cadmium, and mercury all have higher ionization energies than gallium, indium, and thallium, respectively. And so again, generally increasing going to the right, but not from zinc to gallium, not from cadmium to indium, not from mercury to thallium. And again, not all of you will be on the hook for that, but uh, on, on your study guide, on the big periodic table, those are highlighted in red along with uh, nitrogen's column and beryllium's column as well. Okay, so common question you'll get might involve either the general trend or the exceptions. They're both possibilities. So let's say I give you uh, lithium, beryllium, boron, and carbon. And I say which of these ABCD has the highest first ionization energy? And so going from lithium to beryllium to boron to carbon, we can see that carbon's gonna be the highest. But I mean, I've got this in front of me and I can see the numbers and you know, and things of this sort. However, what we should realize is that the furthest to the right as we're going across is carbon and that's not where the exception is. So carbon is gonna have that highest first ionization energy. Now, if we throw nitrogen onto this list and have A, B, C, D, E, so Bell should be going off in your head to be like, there's something special about nitrogen. But the comparison where there's something special is nitrogen compared to oxygen, not nitrogen compared to carbon. So nitrogen is the furthest to the right. We're not dealing with the exception and nitrogen would be the correct answer. Okay, so you could get something on the, uh, a question on the general trend like that, but you might also get one that's gonna be about the exception. So let's take lithium off this list and let's add oxygen. So, and now we'd have, you know, again, which has the highest first ionization energy? Choices A, B, C, D, and E. And now's where you get the exception. The furthest to the right on the periodic table is oxygen, but we have to remember that nitrogen actually beats oxygen having that half-filled P subshell. And so the correct answer would be nitrogen in this case, and they'd totally be testing you on the exception. So uh, you have a good chance of either seeing the general trend or the exceptions. Both could appear uh, in a question on your exam. So now that we've talked about the general trend and the exceptions, we've got to conclude this lesson talking about what are known as successive ionization energies. When you uh, go and remove more than just the first electron, if you use the second, the third, the fourth, and we can talk about the first ionization energy, the second ionization energy, the third ionization energy, the fourth ionization energy. And the general trend we just learned only applies to the first ionization energy. It does not apply to anything past that. And, but there's a couple things you do need to know about these successive ionization energies. So. Uh, first off, you should know that it is far easier to remove a valence electron than a core electron. And we're looking at boron's going to be our example here. And boron's got three valence electrons in the second shell. And then it's got a couple of core electrons here in the 1s. And those valence electrons, again, are going to be far easier to remove, being further away from the nucleus, than those core electrons. So if we take a look at the successive ionization energies for boron here, so we're going to have boron gas going to boron plus one, a boron ion plus an electron. So, and this would be the, again, the reaction for the first ionization energy. And it turns out this ionization energy is 801 kilojoules per mole. Now, if we go to remove a second electron, so now we'll have boron plus one, going to boron plus two, plus another electron. Well, notice when we lost an electron from boron and turned it into this boron, uh, cation here. 
So we lost an electron from the electron cloud. We learned that, oh, when you form cations, the ionic radius is smaller than the atomic radius. So in this case, boron just got smaller after it lost an electron. And so if we're going to go to remove a second electron after it gets smaller, well, now that electron's closer to the nucleus, it's more attracted to the nucleus, and it's going to be harder to remove. And so we should expect successive ionization energies here to increase as the ion gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the more electrons you remove from its electron cloud. And so for this next one here, it turns out the ionization energy here is going to be 2427 kilojoules per mole. So pretty substantial increase here. So although we'll find out it's relatively speaking not that big as we'll see. So but but substantial up till now in this case uh, for removing that second electron. So let's go to remove a third electron here. So we'll start with boron 2 plus going to boron 3 plus plus an electron. And again, after we move the second electron, boron gets even smaller for its radius. And in this case, making it even more difficult to remove the third electron. And in this case, that makes its way up to 3,660 kilojoules per mole. And again, another increase. And finally, we're going to try and remove a fourth electron. So, and in this case, we've got something to factor in here, is we've already removed all three of the valence electrons in those first three ionization energies. So when we go to remove a fourth electron, we're removing one of these 1s electrons, one of these core electrons. They're significantly closer to the nucleus and significantly more difficult to remove, as we're about to see. And so it turns out this jumps all the way up to 25,026 kilojoules per mole. And so from a pattern like this, what you're supposed to get at, you're supposed to look at this and be like, oh, all these before the big jump are valence. But once you see that huge jump in energy, that's not for a valence electron, that's going to be for a core electron. And so the way this could be presented on a test is they might just give you the data here for the successive ionization energies, first, second, third, fourth. And you're supposed to look at that and be like, oh, there's the big jump at the fourth, which means the first three are valence. And then they might ask you, OK, what element could this be? Well, you'd be like, well, it has to be something with three valence electrons. Something like boron or aluminum would be pretty typical. I mean, technically, it could even be something like scandium, which has the two 4s's and the one 3d for a total of three valence electrons. But most likely, you're probably going to be seeing something like boron or aluminum. And just as a reminder, the alkali metals have one valence electron, the alkaline earths two valence electrons, borons group three valence electrons, carbons group four, nitrogens group five, oxygens group six, the halogen seven, and the noble gases eight valence electrons. So I'm looking for something with three, boron, aluminum, somebody out of that group are your most likely candidates. Now this could also be represented in graphical form as well. All right, so if we represent this graphically here, we can see here that the ionization energy is going to increase as we go from the first to second to third, but the big jump again is going up to the fourth. And again, once you get that big jump, you should realize, oh, that's no longer a valence electron like these guys. That's going to be a core electron up here instead. And so from a graph like this, if they ask you what element could you know, this correspond to, again, you should recognize, oh, it's got three valence electrons. And once again, that's probably boron or aluminum or somebody from that group. So there's one last way we can ask a question of you with something like this. So, and the question might be, which of the following has the highest second ionization energy? And we might put sodium, magnesium, aluminum, and silicon. And the big thing I want to point out here is that sodium's got one valence electron, magnesium's got two, so aluminum's got three and silicon has four. Let's write that in. So sodium's got one, magnesium two, aluminum three, and silicon four valence electrons. And the question I'm going to ask is who's got the highest second ionization energy? And one of the mistakes students make is they try to start applying that general trend. They're like, well, it increases going to the right, Chad, so it should be silicon, right? Well, again, that trend, that general trend is only for the first ionization energy. And this question is what, you know, which of these has the highest second ionization energy? And the way you answer this question is you have to figure out, well, which of these, when I go to remove a second electron, am I out of valence electrons and I'm trying to remove a core electron? Well, if by the time you're removing that second electron, you're already out of valence, that must have meant you only had 
one valence electron to start. For all the rest of these, it, when you go to remove that second electron, you still have valence electrons you're removing, but not for sodium. And so for sodium, we'd already see the big jump in trying to, you know, in energy and trying to remove that core electron instead. And so if you're looking for the highest second ionization energy, you're probably just looking for a species with only, not probably, you're, you're looking for a species with only one valence electron and you're looking for one of those alkali metals in that case. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider hitting that like button? It lets YouTube know that they should be sharing this with other students as well. And if you're looking for general chemistry practice, uh, check out my general chemistry master course, quizzes, chapter tests, practice final exams, final exam rapid reviews, all part of the course. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description, a free trial is available. Happy studying.